this begins our lesson on Chapter 1, Matter, Measurement, and Problem Solving, and we'll also be looking at atoms and atomic structure during our lesson as well. So we'll have our notes out together, and I'll be talking you through our first and our, our next chapter as well in our PowerPoint presentation. The expectation is that you fill your note pack in with me, and I will give credit for that when I see you again next week. So matter, measurement, and problem solving, the beginning of our topic in which we talk about matter and how it's classified. We'll look at um, problem solving strategies typically called dimensional analysis and as well as uh, atoms it being the basic composition of all of matter. Go ahead and flip to your next slide. I'll let the computer catch up. There will be a delay typically when I try to uh, switch screens, so just a moment of patience as that uh, happens pretty slow with this Camtasia program. We know that atoms and molecules uh, are the basic composition of matter, and as we look at that basic structure, what determines its properties are really the, the composition of what what matter is, is uh, built from. The properties of matter that determine atoms and molecules are composed, typically you'll look at molecules um, and the number of atoms that create you know, the basic composition of the component. For instance, carbon monoxide versus carbon dioxide. We see that carbon monoxide on the left side of your um, screen has just one carbon atom and one oxygen atom. Physical properties would include a colorless, odorless gas. It burns in a bright blue color out of a flame. It actually binds to our hemoglobin in our blood, which um, suffocates uh, in terms of squelching out the oxygen capacity of the hemoglobin, and people could actually die from carbon monoxide poisoning. On the other hand, adding one more oxygen to create a molecule called carbon dioxide, we see a completely different um, compound in terms of its physical properties. One carbon with two oxygen atoms creates a colorless, odorless gas as well, but this is incombustible and it does not bind with our hemoglobin. So <clears throat> in terms of like a tailpipe of a car engine, we understand that as we're combusting octane, which is the major component of gasoline, we have this um, complete combustion producing carbon dioxide, the majority of the reaction follows that, and then carbon monoxide is due to the inefficient ratio of burning that gasoline, and out comes carbon monoxide as kind of a byproduct, very different physical properties in terms of you know, running your car engine or your snowblower engine in a closed garage or wouldn't be in, in a, um, a, an ideal thing to do. So we're looking at these atoms and molecules really giving the characteristics of, of uh, the physical and chemical properties of our components. We understand that atoms are the submicroscopic building blocks of matter. Can atoms cannot be broken down any further. Whereas molecules are groups of atoms that are bonded together and that whole bonding arrangement determines its um, physical and chemical properties. And we start to look at the different geometric shapes as molecules form and giving that a significant uh, difference just by adding another atom. So different shapes and different patterns all relate to the physical and chemical qualities of our atoms and molecules. Chemistry is the science that seeks to understand the behavior of matter by studying how atoms come together to make molecules. And that's really what's of interest to a chemist is trying to put atoms together, perhaps even rearrange them to form new compounds that eventually will benefit mankind. So our scientific approach to knowledge, it simply says, Philosophers begin to try to understand the universe. They begin just thinking and reasoning about ideal behavior. Philosophers try to imagine why things are occurring. Scientists will try to explain those wonders. They'll understand that universe through experimental design and observation and beginning to draw conclusions based on those observations and understanding that experiments have to be able to be run over and over again, giving same results. So as scientists began gathering this empirical knowledge we call an observation, I just think of observations as those things that we rely upon um, our senses for. If I can see it, hear it, feel it, 
you know, in terms of a heat exchange, for instance, um, smell it, but certainly not taste it in the chemistry lab. Those reliance of our senses create observations, and we begin to gather what's called qualitative observations or qualitative analysis. Those observations that do not rely upon numbers. If we say something like, the soda pop is a liquid with a brown color and a sweet taste, Bubbles are often seen floating through it. Those are observations just using our senses. We're not explaining a darn thing. We're just sharing with you what we are observing. Some observations compare to a characteristic of a numerical value. In other words, I can tell you quantitatively exactly how much soda pop I have in a serving in terms of 27 grams of sugar per 240 mils of serving. Sometimes observations rely on numbers. That's called quantitative. Sometimes observations rely just simply on our senses and those would be called qualitative. <clears throat> From observation to understanding we begin to gather in our scientific method these observations and we try to begin to interpret them. We form what's called a hypothesis. It really is just our tentative interpretation or explanation for our observation. We're trying to explain, but it right now is just an educated guess. The term hypothesis, that sweet taste of soda pop is due to the presence of sugar. Now I may or may not be right, but I'm trying to explain a good educated guess. So what we try to do then based on our observation is gather a, you know, a good possible guess to explain what it is we're observing and then we start to experiment. When we begin testing ideas, we generate data, and data and data must be reliable. We use what's called a control with just one variable. We know an experiment generates observations that begin to validate or perhaps even disprove what we were explaining or attempting to explain. So that testing of ideas creates that experimentation. So from specific to general observations, we call a scientific law. It is a statement that summarizes all past observations and predicts future observations. For instance, the law of conservation of mass. In a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. We simply rearrange atoms as reactants turn to products. There is no such thing as actually destroying matter. Now I know in a nuclear reaction we actually do destroy matter and turn it into energy but I believe it important to state that in an ordinary chemical reaction where bonds are simply breaking and new bonds are forming we do not create nor destroy and that is held up loud for, for uh, the test of time. So a law allows you to predict future observations because we've proven it. I mean, the law of gravity. Every time I drop an apple, it's going to fall to the ground. So you can't choose to violate a scientific law. It has been proven beyond the shadow of a dot to be true. It's a little different than from what we call a theory. These are still evolving explanations in which data is still not completely in on. So it's our potential explanation based on a small number of observations. It's the best description we have so far. I think of something called the modern atomic theory. What does an atom look like? Well, we'll never stop gathering evidence as technology continues to improve and gather further and further information about what builds up a, an atom. Well, I remember learning protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, electrons are outside, but as technology has gotten better, we've been able to smash apart atoms in, an, in a, an, an accelerator, and out comes even tinier particles. So we're still learning about this. Therefore, it is called a scientific theory. When we think about the scientific method, we kind of look at a flow chart. And if I begin to think about this flow chart in terms of what it's sharing with me, Observations are where we begin this journey. Careful noting and recording of natural phenomena start to create what we call observations. 
Then we start to explain those, just taking guesses, tentative explanation of a single or small number of observations. We call that our hypothesis. That's our best guess so far, trying to explain our observations, but then we put them to the test. We design an experiment following a procedure to test that idea, and we collect data. And that data must be uh, duplicated over and over and over again. If it is, we can create a law. That law must be confirmed by the entire scientific community. I, as a single scientist, couldn't explain and, and claim all of a sudden a new law. It has to be reproducible. Otherwise, we create what's called a theory, where it's just a general explanation, but data is still being gathered, and we're not quite ready to say this is true for every situation. So these relationships between pieces of the scientific method really just begins to explain what we call the scientific method. The scientific method describes what happens and explain why things happen. And look at the top area. Applies to a small number of events or applies to all events. We begin to see the difference between our four vocabulary words, observation, law, hypothesis and a theory. If I'm trying to explain why, it's a hypothesis for a small number of events, or it might be a theory if I'm trying to explain a, a more broad general category. If it's an observation, it's me observing using my senses. But if I'm applying it to all events, I'm trying to create a law. When we begin to classify matter, we begin to think of the states of matter really being is that physical in, in terms of a gas, a liquid, or a solid. Chemical and physical properties of matter I think really of as adjectives. What can I say about a substance without changing its identity? That's a physical property. What can I say about a compound as it begins to undergo a chemical change? we'll be describing chemical properties. So physical and chemical changes are an actual verb. Properties are a description. Let's pause here for a moment and pick up when you're ready again.